if I don't manage that. Should be well, uh, it's a little little loud. <laughs> we need a mic. Uh, I, yeah, well there are mics here. Is that mic on as well? Okay, that sounds alright. Okay. Could could everyone start finding some seats, please? We would like to begin the debate, I guess. Okay, so welcome everyone. It's great to see that some people came even though this was not announced so early. Um, I hope some people are also streaming in from the internet. We try to advertise that a bit. Um, in any way, my name is Daniel. I'm from WikiLeaks and uh, we host this session here today sort of um, to talk about the issue of censorship that we're all experiencing in our countries and uh, about the, the issue in a global context and what all these developments mean for our reality and what we need to, how we need to organize in the future. So uh, I think everyone here is uh, in some way has, been, has come across the inter internet censorship issues that came, came up in the last few years uh, throughout Europe. And um, what we see is that uh, our enemy is taking on a global approach. So the, in, behind the doors, people are organizing themselves and they are putting up a global effort to harmonize their censorship efforts, to bring um, a global harmonization to these technical systems, to the lists that they exchange. And we think it's immediately important to respond in a kind of a global manner, that all these activist groups we have all over the world, that they organize themselves and come together for one global voice against censorship. And in that respect, we would like to have this panel today as a first introductory uh, debate about a global organization for against censorship, which uh, shall be, let's say, something that enhances our society so we can all um, share our experiences and come together to fight this topic. Okay. In any ways, we have seven people here on the panel. Um, we have Rob, who is the founding member of uh, Access for All and has a long-term uh, relationship with these events. He has been involved in the past events quite uh, from the beginning. <laughs> I guess everyone knows him anyways. Um, he's also a political activist, so it's quite important to have his views on the debate here. Um, we have Francisca, um, who is uh, the person that in Germany created uh, the first German petition against, um, against the censorship system that is going to be introduced. Um, it's been the largest and the most successful online petition that was ever filed in uh, the German online petition system, so 134,000 people that have signed it, and there still is no real voice, so it's interesting to talk about that as well. Uh, we have Roger, the main developer of Tor, um, who from a totally different perspective has a view on how censorship works throughout the world and how it can be circumvented. Um, we have Karen, who is uh, very familiar with censorship, uh, for example, via Scientology. 
um, legal efforts to suppress information in this world. Uh, she has had a 10 year struggle against Scientology on a legal level. So um, we have Padelun, um, who is a long term German activist for privacy. Uh, he's been involved in the in a big um, campaign against the Data Retention Act and similar things. Um, and then we have Anne. Uh, she's a former MI6 intelligence officer that has blown the whistle, so she can give a completely different angle on this. Um, she's also by now become an activist for uh, civil liberties. She's a journalist. She wrote some books, so it's good to have her views on this uh, panel also. And we have Julian. Um, who is the investigative editor of WikiLeaks and uh, from, let's say, the perspective of our organization and his personal background uh, that has some views on this topic also. Um, we would like to structure this debate so that every panelist has a, can make a quick introduction of around three to four minutes of his views on the topic, on why it is important, what the angles are. And then we would like to open up the debate for everyone in the audience so you can ask questions, um, make suggestions, talk about certain angles of this uh, problematic that we're facing. So thanks, and uh, I guess I'll pass the mic to Rob. And... Can you stand up? No, that, okay, well, okay, okay. just as you feel um, comfortable. I wasn't really uh, uh, prepared to, to uh, hold a, a speech here. I guess uh, one of the points that I think about a lot when I think about censorship is that we may be over-focusing on technical systems and technical ways to circumvent censorship. Um, our movement is continuously telling people that we have all these cool technologies that make it completely impossible for people to, to, to uh, uh, commit censorship or to, to, to uh, suppress our words or to even find out who we are, anonymity. Uh, we. We say these things a lot, and, and it sort of de-emphasizes that you need very courageous people to beat censorship. We still need people to run the Tor servers. We need people to run Wiki, WikiLeaks to be visible. To um, If we do not have this infrastructure of people that are willing to put their name on it, if that are willing to say, well, I stand for what I do, if we, if we emphasize over and over again that, that we somehow don't, don't need this anymore, that we can all be sort of in the anonymous crowd, uh, uh, that's not really true, and, and it's really important, I think, that we should keep emphasizing this. I guess this is really the one sort of deeper thought that I want to leave you with, and, and I want to hear what everybody has to say, and I want to get into the discussion as soon as possible. So I'll pass on the mic. Yeah, hi. Um, uh, during the last months and weeks, um, I experienced a lot of, um, well, yeah, new things. I learned a lot. We all learned a lot. But very often I came to a point in the whole fight against uh, that law that's going to be implemented in Germany uh, where I really wished to have more information about what's going on in all the other European countries. Where are those people in France and Italy and Spain all over the world that had already those fights, that have the experiences that could have helped us. And um, there are so many topics coming up that we can already see, and every one of us knows probably what the next steps are that all of our gov governments um, will take. And um, I think it's really important for us to, to join the forces that are there to be ready to, to fight against what's coming and to learn from each other. So. Um, this whole, well, yeah, more or less, it was more or less a week that we spent here um, is, for me, the base to, to prepare something that we will need in the next month and years. So I really hope that we can, yeah, join our forces here to prepare something that will help us all in the near future. Um, I think that's all for now. If you have more questions on what happened during the last month in Germany, then I'm happy to answer those. But um, for now, that's all. OK, so I'm going to talk very briefly about the technology perspective on these things. Uh, I originally built the Tor network for anonymity purposes for people in the U.S. and Europe and civil liberties goals. And then I started getting mail from people in China saying, thanks for the tool, now I can read BBC. 
And we started getting more and more mail from all sorts of people around the world who were using it not so much for the privacy properties, but for the reachability properties. Now I can get to websites that I wasn't able to get to before. So that's sort of how we fell into the blocking resistance side of things. Mostly when I think of censorship, I think of governments censoring their internet and what sort of tools we can work on that can automate the process of letting people get around that. And another piece of that, so once you have an overlay network like Tor, where you can build paths through the network and pop out somewhere, you can actually start researching this censorship. You can say, I want to build a path through the Tor network and come out in China, and I want to see what Google looks like from China. I want to see whether I can reach BBC today. So this actually lets us learn how the firewalls are working and what's being censored at the time. And then I guess the last point is, uh, to echo what Rob was saying, it's not so much the technology. A lot of this is really a social problem. There are a lot of people in China right now who are saying, I'm so glad my government filters the internet. I'm so glad my government keeps me safe. And while the majority of the people in these countries are thinking that, I can't build a tool that will solve the problem. We need to change the culture so that they stop thinking that, so that they start wondering what else the internet could look like. And, I mean, another example, I was talking to somebody from Thailand three or four years ago, and they sent me mail and said, uh, torproject.org is not reachable for my country anymore. I thought I lived in a democracy. What the heck is going on? I'm going to sue them. And then a year later, the tanks rolled, and we learned that, in fact, maybe they didn't live in a democracy. So in that sense, Tor is an early warning system for which countries are going to be having problems down the road. And, and then the other side of that, uh, we were talking to people in Saudi Arabia. If you're in China, you look around at the people around you and you wonder who's going to inform on you and you try to figure out, uh, should I be willing to, to talk to people about what's going on? Should I be willing to go to this website? If you're in Saudi Arabia, it isn't that there are informers out there somewhere. It's that your family is going to figure out what you did and which websites you went to and that you're posting anti-government stuff you're not so much worried about getting thrown in jail. You're worried that your father is going to beat you for not being an ordinary person. So there are a lot of different cultures that we have to think about at the same time. It's not just a technology problem. We still very much think of censorship the old way, as in there is a book, there's a newspaper, and there is a website, and it's been taken off the shelves uh, out of the shops or off the web. And I think it's really much, it's time that we start thinking of censorship in a new way, something that's there and that we're simply no longer able to see because it's being filtered away. It's being blocked from our view. More and more countries are sort of installing all kinds of lists, whether it's a child pornography list, whether it's, as they had in Australia, uh, lists of sites that talked about suicide or about violence or what have you. Uh, in many countries, it's not clear which sites exactly are on that list and on what basis. Um, and one of the things that we found out in, in Europe is that sometimes police officers will put sites on the list um, claiming that only countries are being blocked from which there is no, where you have no legal recourse. Um, for instance, child pornography in all these weird uh, Uzbekistan, Kaz Kazakhstan places. Well, actually, many of the sites that are being blocked are European sites. So what they're censoring is not, apart from child pornography, what they're also censoring is people seeing that European police is not doing its work. And nobody knows. Nobody knows what's going on. And at the same time, everybody has indeed this sort of feeling, ah, yeah, but the Internet is made nice and safe. There is no child pornography anymore. But the only thing that we're doing is blocking the awareness that it ex exists. We're also blocking the fact that the police aren't doing anything the moment they can, and nobody has any recourse to see whether that's the only thing that's being filtered. Nobody knows which lists are being fed to providers to block, and actually, most of the time, much more is being filtered away than we know uh, and than is being told. So there is a new tool for censorship, and we're not fully aware of how it works and its ramifications. You have to imagine in our governments are many, many old men with black pencils. 
They don't have any idea what Internet is. They speak about an information society, and this is important to make a government into information society. And this is a mistake, because we don't need and we don't want and we don't have an information society. What we want is a communication society. That means everybody is talking to everybody, not some people, some few people with black pencils speak to everybody else. It's not so one guy can say do this and you all have to do what this one guy with the black pencil say. And they, a little bit they understand that the idea of information society in their heads is not true. They see people are communicating. They see that people come together. They see that people do things and uh, uh, starting politics. And so it's very, very normal that they need censorship. Have I explained it why? You have to say no, no. Thank you. That's the idea. Hi, I've been asked to talk tonight about uh, what it's like to be on the receiving end of massive state censorship. I was recruited to work for MI5, which is the UK Domestic Security Service. Uh, that is usually, or used to be, truncated down to UKSS, uh, but they realised that didn't sound too good, so they changed that in the 1990s. I worked there for six years in the 1990s, where I met my former partner, David Shaler, and we saw so many things going wrong. Uh, including illegal telephone taps, spying on government ministers, innocent people being put in prison, bombs that could and should have been prevented going off on UK streets, up to and including state-sponsored murder. And after six years of this, we decided that this just was not what we'd signed up to do, so we left and we decided to blow the whistle, which meant in the UK going to the press... And then we felt the full force of the state reprisals because the intelligence agencies in the UK have probably the most draconian laws protecting them out of any Western democracy. There is a piece of legislation called the Official Secrets Act which ensures that anyone who's ever worked for the services becomes a criminal even if they report crime on the part of those services. You can never say anything ever to anyone about what you've seen going on there, even if that includes murder. That piece of law, though, also applies to journalists. They can break the law if they report what the whistleblower is saying. So I ended up having to go on the run, literally, around Europe, live in hiding for almost a year, uh, live in exile for two years, and my ex-partner went to prison twice because we reported state-sponsored murder. We also uh, saw friends and families being arrested, and we saw journalists being arrested and prosecuted, and in some cases convicted, for daring to report these disclosures. Now, as I said, there's the Official Secrets Act. But there's a, another battery of behind-the-scenes means that they can use to stifle dissent in the UK. These includes things, include things like civil law injunctions, which they applied against the media and against the whistleblowers. Uh, there are also more informal networks of um, things like the Denotice Committee in the UK, which is a volunteer committee of senior media people as well as intelligence people who censor themselves. And we also have a sort of charmed circle of journalists who write about these issues, who, um, whose jobs de depend on reporting what they are told to report. So they self-censor as well. It's a cultural thing. And this is a major problem in our society, I think, certainly in the UK, but in many other countries too, because you end up with a closed groupthink in the intelligence community you end up in a situation where people within government are too frightened to speak out, which then leads to illegal wars based on lies, as we saw in the UK, uh, where we see things like uh, the application of torture by states like the US and the UK. People are too frightened to speak out. In fact, recently in the UK, there have been a number of intelligence officers who appear to have perjured themselves in UK courts by saying, no, 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 of course we weren't involved in the torture of terrorist suspects, but lo and behold, they were. And, of course, we also saw um, a document, a very notorious document that was leaked, called the Downing Street Memo. And in this, it recorded a, the minutes of a meeting between Tony Blair and his advisers in the run-up to the Iraq War. And the head of MI6, the external intelligence-gathering organisation, 
was recorded to have said that the facts were being fitted around the policy, the predetermined policy, the decision to go to war. Now, this is why we need whistleblowers. This is why we need leaks, so that we can hold the governments and the intelligence agencies to account. This is what our media should be doing, but they're frightened off. And I really wish that WikiLeaks had been established in 1997 rather than 2007. So it's a real privilege to be here, and um, please all keep pushing for more and more disclosure and more transparency and, and accountability of government. Thank you. Hello, can everyone hear me? Good. Um, so at WikiLeaks, we are kind of a canary in the coal mine because we specialize in taking uh, material that is censored or is uh, legally injuncted, uh, that is classified, that people really don't want revealed and presenting it to the world. Uh, about once every two weeks, uh, someone threatens to sue us and that goes forward to a next level about once every month. However, we started out under the basis that the least transparent governments in Africa uh, and the former Soviet Union were the ones that would benefit the most uh, from uh, publishing revelations, getting stuff out to the, to the public, revealing corruption. But it turns out it's a global problem. When money is laundered from Kenya by the president, it goes into Swiss banks, it goes into London banks, it goes into property in Australia. Similarly, censorship is a global problem. Uh, censorship is in fact at a technological level led by the West. So-called democracies like uh, the United Kingdom have secret courts with secret court hearings that produce secret orders demanding that the press censor uh, papers. They've demanded it of us. we have released some of those court uh, papers. And now, as every form of media moves onto the internet, newspapers, TV, the communications between political parties and their supporters, communications between every individual here in this room, we find a position where technological censorship is able to affect probably what will be every media uh, in the world. Now, some of you may have known that we're every least detailed secret blacklists of censorship uh, from many countries, uh, many times, in fact, uh, from Thailand, from China, uh, from Australia, from Norway, from Denmark, uh, and we hope from Germany later on. Uh, these countries swap information on these lists, and when the lists are secret, when they're kept out of sight, there is no transparency. Uh, in the case of Australia, when we released the secret censorship uh, blacklist, it was found that only 32% uh, of the list was related to underage images at some stage. But politically, it had been pushed as a mechanism to combat child pornography, and that's probably a story uh, familiar to many of you uh, in this room. So what is the big picture? Why is this happening now? between governments? Why are they responding in the same way? Well, the internet has been a fixed target for about eight years, and at the same time, it's become more and more important politically and economically. So these power interests in the various countries have been moving together to try and take control uh, of something that um, threatens their interests. Whenever states come together into a super state like the European Union, or states all over the world are coming together informally, becoming globalized informally uh, into uh, a compatible union of laws, um, you have a situation where the new standard is to be defined. And that's the battle at the moment. What is the new standard for publishing freedoms? What is the new standard for communication? We're protected somewhat by, by placing our information in different states by playing one state off against another. But as you can see what's happening with Europe, uh, a new standard is being developing that's compatible between countries. And we will see a new legal standard compatible uh, between most of the industrialized countries of the world. So is that standard to be the standard of China? Or is it to be the standard of the Netherlands? 
Is it to be the standard of the most free country or the least free country? So we have an opportunity to push that standard to be the union of press protection freedoms, the union of whistleblower freedoms and the union of communications freedoms and not their intersection. Okay, so um, are there any comments or questions at this point in time that anyone would want to follow up with it in the audience? Um, if not, uh, is it, or on the panel, yeah, sorry. There's a mic in the middle, just um, line up and maybe we can have Karen in the... Hi. It's okay? Like that. Okay. Um, I just, it's just a little remark about um, Annie's comment of the OSA, the Official Secrets Act. It's um, basically implemented here in the Netherlands as well. Just a couple of months ago, uh, two journalists were detained from the Telegraph newspaper who released um, state secrets, um, which basically, um, I, well, I believe every journalist has the duty to release state secrets if that is to the general interest of the public. So just want to point out to everyone in the audience that it is happening here as well. So thank you very much. Okay, so uh, any other questions in the panel or any comments to what was said before? Um, I think what we all see is that uh, after the panelists have um, introduced themselves and uh, their angle on this topic is that um, censorship is occurring in, from many perspectives on our society. So it's not easy to pinpoint it to just a, just a problem that we have with the internet maybe or a problem that we have in a government agency that is pr trying to prevent publication of information or, or corporate interests. So it's a it's a multi-level effort where people try to suppress information from, from various angles. And um, I think uh, it is very important that we all um, understand and, uh, and uh, try to form one voice that is uh, speaking out any, against any form of uh, censorship and not just concentrating on an effort on the internet or shaping transparency in a government. It needs to be a more harmonized effort that is, uh, I think, has to be addressed. Um. So another piece of that, I was talking mostly about censorship in third world countries and China and really oppressive regimes, and then we've been hearing stories about censorship in the UK and Germany and Netherlands and the US, and we really have to think of this not as that censorship and this censorship. It's really one category that's affecting all of these different countries and all of these different uh, citizens in each of these countries. We can't think of it as, I'm glad I don't live in China. We have to start thinking of it as one country and, and one world and one people and, and how to solve the problems everywhere. Hello, I wanted to ask a specific question, uh, the question of media. Um, why do you think that uh, journalists are very often very pro-censorship? Like the Spiegel has a, in this newest issue a big tagline, um, internet should have limits, uh, image should, internet should be controlled. So uh, why are journalists so pro-censorship? I'm, I'm pretty cynical when they are. Um, I would say in the case of Spiegel, it's competition. It's, it's that simple. Um, the older journalist establishment uh, feels that the internet, and rightly so actually, uh, is uh, economic competition. There's also a bit of 
playing to the popular mood. Uh, mainstream publications, and it's uh, perfectly reasonable for there to be mainstream publications, uh, have to act like the good guy in order to be tolerated by their readers. And if their readers have a particular view about what is good and what is bad, it provides uh, an opportunity for uh, these organisations, like the Spiegel, uh, to show that they are on the reader's side of the fence, uh, even when that uh, can be misleading the reader, even when that is self-destructive uh, in the press. Hi, yeah, I mean, I've had some experience of uh, the media and the way it can be controlled from two sides of the fence, really. Um, one, of course, there's the sort of legal sanctions, as I mentioned in uh, my short introduction. But there's a sort of culture as well. Certainly in the UK, we have this um, establishment-type uh, grouping of people, the political elite, whatever you want to call them. And the press should be holding the establishment to account, you know, big business or government or intelligence agencies or whatever. But quite often they get seduced into being part of that establishment. They have a sort of vested interest in not... Um, annoying the sources of their stories, i.e. their PR, uh, too much. Otherwise, they don't get the stories, and then they lose their jobs. So it's quite a seductive thing, partic particularly when you get into the world of intelligence. You're part of the charm circle as well. You, you're getting stories nobody else gets. Um, certainly as well, just picking up on the intelligence side, there is a section, I should have mentioned before, called um, Information Operations within MI6, the External Intelligence Agency, which is their precisely to plant stories, fake stories in the media, or to manipulate and spin stories in the media to their own interests. Um, so it can be quite a sort of hard-nosed approach to how you can control the media on certain issues. And certainly over the last decade, we've seen government spin of the media reaching new lows as well. So there's all sorts of different levers and mechanisms that uh, can dissuade journalists from wanting to be the new Woodward and Bernstein. Quite often they just become mouthpieces for the establishment. Uh, one word to the former news magazine Spiegel. I have the fear the people, th th there are some very intelligent people, very few intelligent people and, and many very silly, no, not silly, uh, very normal people and my fear is they believe in that what they write and that what they don't write. Another really important part of the explanation is that um, it's still not many journalists who really understand how the internet works. They know a couple of um, mechanisms for censorship in the real world, as in somebody publishes something um, and it's um, either ruled by a judge to be non-compliant and therefore it's taken off the shelves or you know that you can't publish certain th things, you can't publish slander, so you don't. And they think that the same mechanism as is applies to the internet. And they don't know all the intricacies of the net, so they translate their knowledge, analog knowledge, to a new medium that they don't fully understand, thus not understanding the implications of what they're saying. And for instance, with all these filtering lists, nobody... It, it starts by saying, yeah, it's against child pornography. And everybody goes, yeah, sort of, yeah, that's a good idea. Actually, we should. But nobody knows the intricacies of how the filtering works, and nobody understands that if we can't check what is being filtered... The, it's so easy to block more um, than what you actually want to block, even because sometimes different websites share the same IP address. So you might be filtering much more than you intend. That's the kind of technical stuff that especially this people doesn't know to hoots about. So that makes, adds another layer of com uh, complexity to the whole censorship issue. I, I would like to, I would like to shift the discussion a little bit, if I may, uh, because I think I think the idea here, also, at least as I understand it, is a little bit to figure out what's going on and what are we going to do about it. Yes. Um, uh, one of the things that worries me about about this field and about a lot of other fields that that are in our general sphere of interest and that have to do with law enforcement and intelligence is that. Um, it's extremely hard to figure out where policy is formulated and, and how it's being effectuated. It's extremely hard, just in the European Union, 
to figure out who are the current players, what are they doing, who is, is currently in charge, and which parts of EU policy are just whitewash of some country's national policy. Um, a lot of new people need to get into this, need to get into policy research, uh, uh, political research, need to really start studying what their governments are doing uh, at a very professional level. Uh, there are people already doing this, but, but I just, I'm personally upset when I, when I see how haphazard and coincidental some of our knowledge is. We need, we need a much broader base, we need much more research to, to even understand a, a lot of the things that are going on, at least in my opinion. I guess as well that this is a general issue that we see. Um, there are too many people that might agree to certain things these days and or oppose things and say, I don't want any censorship, but nobody is really, is really up to going on the streets anymore, for example, or putting work into actively fighting a certain development in society. So um, I think we can have a next question as well. Okay. So it, it's very interesting to see that we're now moving into embedded journalism in society as a whole. In wartime, we call it embedded journalism when people only see the, the, the part of reality that is shown to them by the, by the armed forces when they're in law. But actually, my question was regressing to what Annie said, because she said if we had only had, had WikiLeaks, I think the powerful thing of having a face with Annie and actually showing that she is not a fraud and she's actually fleeing her country and, and, and leaving a country and being hunted and, and people being put in prison so on, it actually validates the leak. And as you said, rightfully so, people can actually make up really convincing tricks to, 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 to uh, uh, take certain people out of the game. So I was curious what, what the idea of the people are, what, what the um, misinformation and, and agit prop type of thing and WikiLeaks and or whistleblowing, how this dynamic can be sort of maintained or handled. Thank you. I think it was Daniel who said uh, on the first day that you can always tell if a, a whistleblower has credibility behind them and how hard the authorities go for them. And they really went uh, for Shayla and myself. I mean, you know, as you say, fleeing across Europe and things. Um, in terms of what we can do about that, where we can take it, I think um, we do need, well, I mean, if we can guarantee protection for whistleblowers, this is the difficult thing. Um, I mean, I hear that WikiLeaks can, but <laughs> if I were a whistleblower sitting in MI5 now and I'd witnessed torture, for example, and I wanted to blow the whistle on it, I would be incredibly frightened about where to go to. Um, and how to do it securely. And um, I think a community like this, for example, if they can really put together and, and publicise what they can do, then that might be very helpful indeed. Because uh, I'm not sure how many people actually are really aware out in the greater world. So, so I, I think what the question was getting at is when someone publishes something anonymously, mm. and they're anonymous for their protection, which we facilitate uh, them with both legally and technically, that there's no face to the information and there's not the same emotional punch. Is that correct? Yeah. yeah. So, well, the answer is uh, yes. We're not much help with that. But we can't expect every person... I wish they were. I mean, I wish every person in this room was an Annie uh, or a, an Ellsberg or some of these other uh, famous figures. But... That's not going to happen. Um, maybe we can increase it a little uh, by pushing uh, a system where there's lots and lots of anonymous leaks coming out without any regulation at all. So we say either fix up the Freedom of Information Act, either provide protection for whistleblowers to come out with their face, or we will do it all without any uh, legal oversight at all. Uh, but economically, um, there is not a niche in society for that many whistleblowers. Now, what do you do after you've blown the whistle? Well, some people can 
Some people can write books. Some people can become professional activists, not making much money at all, but maybe just enough to live on. But there's actually not many roles in society. Maybe there's a couple in all of the United States with 300 million people. So I, I actually don't think uh, there's a way to enable lots and lots of whistleblowers to come forward unless it's done in a legislative fashion. And there's got to be a driver uh, for that legislative uh, relief. Uh, there can be a bit of a press driver as well or a community attitude uh, even if there's not legislation, it damps down the police or authoritarian response uh, to pull the action back down to community standards. Mm -hmm. um, can I just make one more point as well? There was a debate in the US uh, about a month or two ago about exactly what protection intelligence whistleblowers should get in the States in the wake of the scandal around torture. And at the moment, they can go to the head of their agency and then they can go to a congressional committee and there were arguments, lots of debates about, well, should they have a little bit more protection? Because they are the people, the very people at the core of the state who are going to see the most heinous crimes if things go wrong. And yet, I think, I believe that uh, it was voted down. There's, so there's no increased protection. But the arguments were interesting, that we need this ventilation for a healthy democracy, that we need this ventilation to stop groupthink within the agencies that leads to illegal wars and torture in Guantanamo Bay as well. So I think, you know, the signs of a healthy democracy should be leaks, and if that can lead to a critical mass, whether or not people have to self-immolate by go, going public, and it is, you know, a career uh, limiting move, should we call it. <laughs> I used to call it, uh, I used to say it was like being a Victorian fallen woman. Once you take the fatal step, there's no going back. So it, it is a big step, but it, I mean, having a forum where you can leak stuff without having to overturn your entire life is invaluable, I think, so thank you. <laughs> I have a comment and a question. Uh, my comment is, um, who can give me the guarantee that in four years we still have government we, uh, which, is, uh, which has enough integrity to handle uh, such a censorship system? Well, there's no such guarantee. That should be enough to stop building uh, censorship systems. Uh, and uh, my question is to the whole panel, uh, all of them may answer it if they want. Is there a way of winning this war? I mean, uh, you've seen the Spiegel. Uh, they are basically writing what people want to read. So uh, if the Spiegel writes what people want to read, people want censorship. Is this, is this war winnable? Or do we have to you know, let it go boom and then say, we told you so? Well, uh, what I learned is that uh, people tend not to be, well, when they read something, they don't really think about what they're reading. So the information they have is the information they get. So, you know, if the Spiegel writes uh, censorship of child pornography websites is good, people believe that this is good, but the whole thing is not explained. People don't know what is behind that, and that's the problem. What we need to do is to explain what the system is, what is behind that, and what does that mean. Most of the people out there have no idea what is being installed right now. So it's easy for them to say, hey, that's cool. I, 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 I'm against child pornography, and I think it's good that it's finally um, taken care of by the state. How can you, how, how can you be against child pornography? That's... that's but thing, that's the know, point. Everyone that's fighting in Germany against that law is not against. It is not saying child pornography is good. But that's easily said in the media, so it, it's Pardon? a good way to, to like, uh, well, uh, uh, like uh, saying uh, being against the uh, the censorship law is is like equal to uh, be pro child pornography. It's easy to say in the media. So you can, you can like, uh, don't know the English word, sorry. Um. It's a, okay, well, um, in any way, I, it, the problem is that it, especially the, the topic of child pornography and censorship are really bad to compare. I mean, these are completely different issues. Child pornography is a society issue and censorship applies to ways of communication. So this is a completely different 
thing and the problem is that these debates are being intermixed and we fight on the wrong ground. We need to talk about censorship and focus about this and defend our ways of communication. The, the hassle is all the time that uh, child pornography is sort of used as a sweetener for censorship. It's the entry for censorship. Yes. Yeah. Okay. That's what I meant. Yeah, I you know, how, how can you be against? How can you be against? Uh, uh, how can you not be against child pornography? We are basically anyone is against child pornography, but that, that's not what anyone said. <laughs> okay. Uh, either I'm missing a point, or but maybe we will get the next question. So. I think, I think the previous person was trying to suggest that the media use child pornography as a smear tactic to um, smear okay, people who yeah. are pro, pro and censorship. Okay. Anyway, uh, my question goes back to some of the media things we mentioned earlier. Um, I think WikiLeaks is a great project and what they do is awesome. But I think the Achilles heel is how much they rely on the media to spread the news of some document that they have leaked. And what with, uh, I think it was Annie, the MI5 lady said earlier, that that um, MI5 and MI6 can control the media like that, and also um, commercial interests like Rupert Murdoch and his group can sort of control the media. Can we really rely on the media to unpartially sort of promote documents, or will they hide things that are bad for them? Remember, it's not just the traditional media anymore. Uh, when a document is released um, that seems important, particularly if, if we say it's important, uh, then all of you can assess it and analyse it. Every blogger, every country in the world can write something about this. Uh, so wh what really keeps the mainstream media mainstream is it has access to sources that most of you don't. If those same sources are presented to you, then you can write uh, some comment on it. So we're not, we're not limited to the mainstream media. Uh, in terms of people like Annie, I mean, I spoke before about that. Um, it's, there is a case, actually. So we did a famous uh, case last year, the Bank Julius Bear case, which revealed uh, money laundering from the Swiss banks through the Cayman Islands. Uh, once that information was in the public, anonymously in the public, and we were sued, then it became an interesting issue. The moral line uh, was already lined up, and at that stage, the whistleblower involved came forward and didn't suffer a legal consequence as a result because the, he had seen which way the wind was blowing, uh, where the legal attack was, where the press interest was. So maybe you can do uh, hybrid circumstances, but uh, I agree. It, uh, my friends say that uh, have been fired from these newspapers in the United States as they rationalise, that the feeling to them is as if they had been totally censored because you can be economically censored. In fact, that is the biggest part uh, of the censorship pyramid, is at the bottom of people uh, who economically can't communicate. Uh, not just journalists that have been fired, but people don't have access to the internet at all, as an example. And others are put under economic threats uh, or pressure to not say particular things. It's something very difficult uh, to deal with, as is self-censorship. Uh, when people see that someone is very, on the rare circumstances, even in Russia it's rare, where a journalist is murdered, this pushes down from the top, you can see the murder, but you can't see all the people that stop writing uh, and stop speaking out. That's invisible. And the same uh, in the United Kingdom uh, with the many, many uh, libel actions that occur in the United Kingdom that don't even reach the law court. Uh, you won't hear about them, but they certainly have an effect uh, on the newspaper industry. Something I should just mention since I've spoken about the traditional media industry, which is important and which, which has won many legal protections for publishing. How did it win the, those legal protections for its industry? How did it manage to get 
a constitutional amendment in the United States. It managed to do that through its power as an industry to protect itself, to introduce laws, to protect its operations. As uh, most of those monopoly media industries lose their monopoly in a global sense, as they're competing with bloggers that have no unions behind them, I think <clears throat> we'll see a state where there is no journalistic force as a powerful industry to keep up those protections. So we need to set the standard now as the world globalises and the new laws have been made. Why we still have the remnants of a powerful media industry. Because pretty soon it's not going to be there. There'll be distribution industries, but there won't be journalistic industries. I just make one very small point about the media as well. There's a very good book that came out in the UK last year by a, a respected investigative journalist called Nick Davis called Flat Earth News. And he um, actually had a study done at a, a university in the UK and established that journalists on mainstream national media, be it print or uh, TV or whatever, have to produce twice as much copy per day in half as much time per day. So this has led to what he has nicknamed journalism. So they just churn out PR reports and puff and, and uh, reports coming out of the government without checking their facts, without going out and talking to people or anything. So it just becomes this treadmill. And I think the general public is becoming increasingly aware and increasingly sceptical about what is reported in the mainstream media for a variety of reasons, you know, including the lies that took us into the war, etc. But, you know, this is something that has been established. It's a sort of factual... Um, analysis of what's going on for journalists now. So I think that's quite interesting. They're painting themselves out of the picture. I don't think so much about journalism, about uh, um, um, censorship. Um, I s think about the aspect of manipulation. Um, on the one side, they collect uh, our privacy uncensored, our personal data, and store it in great uh, files. Perhaps some of you work in this business. Um, and on the other side, they um, uh, have the possibility to manipulate us uh, by, by uh, collecting the information we get. And they also know on um, which, uh, where are the triggers in our person and our life uh, they can use to bring us to buy pink shoes or uh, 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 aluminium hats or things like that. And we are thinking we are funny and we are thinking we are cool, but we only manipulate it. And there I see a... Uh, I, see a yeah, I don't like this. <laughs> I want to live my own life. Mm -hmm. I think it would be good to uh, <laughs> <Okay. laughs> bring more input. <laughs> Uh, my name is Johan. I'm with the IT Political Association of Denmark. Um, and I think that one thing we have to realize is that most of these uh, laws that are passed is passed w because of the easy opinions. When, when uh, After September 11th, everybody was screaming for politicians to do something against terrorism. Um, and of course the politicians chose the easy way they chose to do something that does just look like they were doing something um, and while they were doing that all kind of other um, implications came with it uh, so we ended up with uh, locking off uh, of, uh, everybody here in Europe and especially in Denmark uh, where, where we were the first to Im implement it um, I think that what we have to do is, is try to explain more um, what, what the reasons are and, and, and how it really works out and show the difference between that. Um, we did that in Denmark and uh, as a result uh, it has almost become legit to talk about um, the, the, the errors with, with the locking. So you're not 
automatic now you are not automatically accused of being a terrorist if if <laughs> if you if you talk against the the, the locking um, and because we spoke out other people would feel inclined to speak out too and I, actually uh, two former officers uh, of the um, of the police secret service in in, uh, in Denmark actually had the courage to go out and, and speak against it too and say that th this won't work. But it was only after we did the, 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 the groundwork that allowed other people to, to come out. Now we see it with, with censorship and uh, child pornography is, is what they use in, in Denmark as an excuse. And, and I think it's, it's really important to show that this is just an excuse. And it doesn't help. That, that's the two reasons. I, I think, uh, Karen, what you said is about the excuse for the police <laughs> is, is, is really a good point. Um, so uh, I think the groundwork is that somebody has to have the courage to go out and say, we do not support this for these technical reasons, and that doesn't mean that we are for child pornography. That will allow other people to come out. And in that regard, I'll just uh, use the opportunity to, to thank you at WikiLeaks, uh, because you leaked, of course, uh, the, 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 da the Danish list of, of child, uh, the child pornography filler, where we could show that, that among, amongst uh, other things, there was this uh, Dutch driving school for some reason on the list, and nobody could, ex could explain why. Thanks. <laughs> okay. Um. So, uh, basically, um, I think what we can uh, see is that uh, the experiences are always the same. So, we are finding excuses, politicians are finding excuses, and we all know about this. Um, then we can see, for example, in Germany that we filed a big online petition. There were 134,000 people that signed this petition, and still the state does not really care about this. So we're all struggling on a national level, and I think um, maybe we should start focusing the debate as well a bit about what we can do about this. So we cannot, it's okay that we all understand that this is an issue and we're all sitting in this tent and we're debating it, and I guess it's like we are preaching to the prophets. But in the end, it will, it will uh, be important what happens after this session. And what happens if you all go out here tomorrow and you know that we would like to start an organization that has a global voice against it, but it's not something that anyone on this panel is able to manage alone or us eight together. So it's important that you all start thinking about how you can involve and that you act to, act to, have to act up um, actively on this topic. We can't sit there and just passively grab these things. So like you said, it's important to educate people, but it's more than just understanding it. You have to actively tell it to everyone, and you have to tell them why they actively have to defend their, uh, their position, their freedoms, and everything. Yeah. What is interesting is that if, if you do this enough and, and write on blogs and, and people get out and talk about it, then the mainstream media will pick up on it. We have seen that with terrorism in, in Denmark, and we hope we'll do the same with, with censorship. And, and actually, to some degree, we had the same thing in, in the Netherlands about this uh, child pornography filter. Everybody sort of thought it was a good idea. After I investigated the list and showed that actually there were Dutch sites on that Finnish list that the Dutch police hadn't done anything about, and the list actually served to hide the police not doing anything, there was quite a change in atmosphere. It does help to publish. It does help to talk. And as Julian said in his uh, opening lecture, courage is uh, contagious. It really helps if people stand up. And, um, but also, we need to support those who stand up. We need to support the Annies. We need to support the Julians. That really, really helps. One moment. Um, it's right. It does help. It was the same that happened in Germany. There was kind of huge media coverage. But the problem is we have that law. And we have not won the fight. And there will be other fights coming up, and we have to get better in what we do. So that's why we're here, and that's why we ask your help to come up with a good solution for that. Yeah. 
Yeah, well, this is the <laughs> Freedom Against Fear um, um, demonstration, which takes place on September the 12th in Berlin. Um, maybe Padalun can say something more about it because he's organizing it. One comment first uh, to one sentence just. Even it helps, we don't have to accept censorship. The guy just says, uh, we have to explain to people it don't helps, but this is not the point. Okay, to the demonstration. We make an uh, international uh, action day. International means we make something in Berlin and you have to do something in your countries on the 12... Uh, nine, 9 12th? 9-11 is easier to say. It's one day after the 9-11. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, we make a, a great demonstration. It's a little bit like 1st May uh, for the um, a worker movement. It's uh, for the people who know what Internet is, what an so uh, Internet society is, um, to show, to go to the street, to be visible, visible not only on the Internet, but uh, in the newspapers, uh, in the printed newspapers, not on the website of Spiegel Online. This is, everybody here in this room read it, but nobody else. And uh, so we have to go to, to the street, we have to talk to newspapers, we have to write um, Forderungen, uh, the word claims, uh, we have to claim our rights and uh, we have to be loud, we have to go to the cafes, we have to speak to our mother. Really, when your mother understands you, You are good, you can go to the street and speak to everybody and everybody will understand you. And you have to try it, we have to try it and we should do it. And uh, I hope you in the Netherlands, Rob, you make a great day on the 12th uh, September? Huh? No. no? You will do it? Wrong people organize it, okay. Uh, someone else will do it, okay. Um, I hope that uh, uh, um, in Prague there will be a great event and so on and so on, or you, or you come all to Berlin. I want uh, 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 82 million people in Berlin on this day. Uh, so you are welcome. Um, just to structure this a little bit again in an attempt... Uh, are, are, is anyone asking anything specific about the organization of, of how we could place a global effort on structuring this. This is, I think, where we should lead to and uh, in an effort not to have everyone leaving this tent because people are getting distracted or so and it's going on for a bit. Uh, we might have to have a meeting with people that would be interested in actively helping this thing. So um, whoever has a question to or a comment on that can, can go. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, hi, my name is Gustav and I'm from Sweden. Uh, I would first, the topic is like, what can we do to prevent censorship and how do we solve it? And first I would say I, I really appreciate activism and hacktivism. It's really needed uh, for fighting it. But the problem is the policy making. And the policy problem is the laws that are passed in the parliament. And what we have done in Sweden with that is that we have formed a political party called the Pirate Party. We have made it into the European parli Parliament and we have replaced the bad parliamenticians. So now we are instead, we are voting for the good laws. So I, my question is, what does it need, what does it take for other countries to form another party that will take in place into the Parliament to change uh, the, the laws? That's what we need and that's what we can do. Um, I guess in, uh, in that respect, the Pirate Party is sort of like a grassroots movement. So it came out of uh, the public. It's, a, it's related to a special interest, and it's just covering one small angle of society. And I think uh, for the future, this is what we need. We need uh, groups that do not try to cover all the big aspects of society that we have, but rather very focused groups that have an expert understanding of uh, These things. So in that respect, the Pirate Party is something that is forming and it's spreading all over Europe and it's representing one facet of society that is very important to kept, be kept up. So, no. Hi. Um, I just wanted to let you guys know that I'm um, very much interested in helping out with this new, newly founded organization. And just uh, that was my comment, basically. 
Okay, a room and, for uh, these I people. Would like to Remember this face? Uh, yeah. He has taken on responsibility. So, and I, <laughs> and I would like to first uh, one to step out. And I would like to get together, you know, and uh, exchange ideas on how we uh, could all uh, make a difference. Okay, thank you great. very much. Thanks, Nils. Nils, also from IT Pool of Denmark. Oh, what was right to start with? We have to stand up and fight for the people making this happen, especially anonymity. It's very interesting when you see the tour project, but you are absolutely able, able to run tour and even tour exit nodes in China, Iran, and so on. It's, it might actually get harder than that in, in, in Europe. Uh, that's why we have to fight every single initiative. For example, uh, child porn, it used to be in Denmark, it was illegal to, to sell or download uh, child porn. Uh, last month, two months ago, it was also made illegal to view it. So if you buy random, saw it on your page and your browser, you, you could be uh, uh, fined for, from it or, or, or put in jail. Of course, that means if you have an open access point or one or two exit node, the police might come knocking at your door. So we have a chilling effect uh, against anonymity yes. here. And the same thing for the Hadobe law, there might be a fine for having an open exit point. The next step will, having a, will be for a tour exit node. So we have to fi fight all these things and we have to stand up, but, but anonymity is important in, it, in itself. Okay, yes, I, it's agreed. Um. Yeah. yeah, so very quickly to answer that, there are a bunch of different pieces of that problem that we need to solve. The technology is an important piece, but there's a lot more past that. Uh, in particular, we need to get a lot of people out there understanding how society needs to be. It's not, this stuff is bad, it needs to be censored, and we're going to tell you a big list of everything but not let you see the list of stuff we should censor. We need to explain to people why we need these freedoms, why we need anonymity, why we need uh, the ability to not be censored, uh, not just in the form of tools that let you be free, but we need all the people around the world to believe that these tools should exist. So it's not just let's build better tools, it's also we need to change the whole society so they believe in these tools. And if society continues thinking that we should censor everything and freedom is bad and who needs that stuff, then you're right. Things like Tor are going to fall apart because nobody will be willing, as Rob was saying at the beginning, to actually step up and, and put a name to these things and make them happen. So, um, two more quick questions, hopefully, okay. and uh, thanks. My name's Stuart. Um, I guess my, my question would be, um, is anything at all going on at an international level coordinating this, this, this effort? Um, and if so, what? <laughs> well, we're, we're not aware of anything that really covers uh, all the topics. That's why, actually, we think something needs to be formed. So... Uh, um, in, in Europe, there is EDRI, European Digital Rights uh, Organization, it, which is a sort of coalition of national um, bits of freedoms and EFFs. And uh, um, then again, they don't have much lobby power, so, but they do coordinate, they do exchange information, so people do keep sort of up to date, but it's not a giant organization and nothing compared, as, uh, compared to EFF or anything the like. It's okay. actually something that a lot of in information share uh, in organizations share an interest in, but no one is coordinating a global voice against that particular issue, and that is the problem. It touches everyone from civil liberties to the media protection and whoever. So, okay. can I do a blatant self-advertising, which I'm not involved in? Uh, I work for Internet Society. Internet Society has a working group. It's international. It's 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 a quite a big group of people from different countries that are tackling the Hadopi uh, uh, fallout. Okay, so, so get in touch with us with yeah. your organization. Yeah, sure. So, thanks. And and the cool thing is they do have lobby power. They get the .org money, and they have like FinSurf and all kinds of cool okay. people from the internet history, and they can lobby and they can they can argue like hell. So okay, thanks. Thanks for that. Hello, I'm sorry to be here a second time. Um, you say uh, I should speak to my parents or my mom. So uh, actually, I spoke a lot to my girlfriend. Um, she doesn't understand me. Uh, this is not uh, based on the relationship we have. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> 
but based on uh, on the loop, I say, okay, well, um, the German government spends a lot of money to establish this um, this machine of censorship. Yeah, well, but uh, child porn is bad. Yeah, well, but you see, it's it's also it's a, it's a vicious cycle always. Um, so, what shall I say? And uh, as a side note, we do agree um, that censorship of uh, propaganda of the Third Reich, for example, no one says anything against it. So there are institutions that censor and the public uh, agrees with it. So how can we convince the public that this now is another issue, a different issue? I only had a short comment to the point that the uh, uh, government is pe spending lots of money to install that um, censorship uh, 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 structure, infrastructure. It's actually not because um, the, the ISPs uh, are spending that money, not the government. Learn to talk. How can I learn to talk and to bring a message to people? You go to the street to make a stand and you talk to everybody who comes the way. And you try it and you try it and after two weeks you are very good. You, you, yes, it's the only way to learn it. Just talk. Go to people. Sometimes you have people that you stand and say, okay, you are right, go away. Um, <laughs> and sometimes you really learn to bring your information to the people. And you have to learn it, go to the street, make word, uh, print posters and give it to the people. With regards to, to your girlfriend, one really, really proper response is, uh, yeah, child pornography is bad, but were you looking for it? Do you need such a filter? The, the answer is probably no. Um, the filter is being implemented for people who don't need it because they're not looking for porn anyway. Those who want children, child pornography are usually smart enough to evade these tools that are being put into place, which actually is begging the question, why do we need such a filter? Because the people to, to whom it actually makes a difference, the people who can't reach stuff anymore, are the ones who weren't looking for it to begin with. So it's sort of self -def That is a way that you can explain it. You don't need to argue whether child pornography is good or not. You can, uh, you can dispute it on the level of effectivity and whether it serves its purpose. It doesn't, so it's useless. Okay, these two more questions, and then I guess we have to um, end that debate. Uh, people are going to get tired or so. Thanks. Okay, thank you. So uh, I'm not European, so I'm sorry if uh, my question sounds funny. So as, I, as far as I understand, uh, we think that some body, some group of people are trying to control the Internet, and we build this movement in order to have more freedom of speech. So my question is that, how are we so sure that our movement is not actually controlled? Is that it's not actually controlled? Yes. Well, uh, I guess, at least from the experience that we have with WikiLeaks, um, uh, it's a lot about trust. So it's going to be built by people for people, and it's going to be based on the trust that we here met each other, and I guess that's the only basis for any kind of organization you can have anyways. So just make sure that you know the people you're dealing with and build it from that. So. Well, but I, I believe that we are human beings, so we, we all have our weakness. So weakness should cause some fear. Yeah, well, well I'm not sure what that is aiming at anyway, actually. So, I mean, I understand it's a problem that we need to structure this organization and it be trusted and these things, but that's not something we can, I don't know, explain right now on stage, I guess, so... You're ha very welcome to join us after this talk or maybe tomorrow and then we discuss how we're going to proceed with that. And your opinion is perfectly welcome. Okay. okay? Thank Thanks you. a lot. Just a, a small comment. Uh, one of the persons before me said that uh, censorship of, na for example, Nazi propaganda would be a good thing, uh, if I heard him correctly. And uh, 
I like to disagree with that. Uh, because what you see, for example, in, in, uh, on, on Swedish neo-Nazi forums, uh, when, when there's a published case of, for example, a uh, Holocaust denier getting a charge in uh, Germany, uh, what, uh, what happens then is that the neo-Nazis all go, hey, look at us, we must be, we, we must be right. Why else would they be charging us or prevent, preventing us from speaking in other ways? Uh, so uh, we actually censoring, uh, for example, Nazi propaganda would do work for the Nazis, not against them. Yeah, and it's actually, censoring is always working for those who are oppressed. It's the same with child pornography. It's pushing people more into the underground where they can organize themselves. So, yeah, okay. So, um, I guess uh, we could call it a night, at least for now. Um, if every, anyone in the audience is really keen to help with building this organization, providing infrastructure, doing some of the groundwork that will be needed, um, please join us after the talk here in the front so we can note down some details or can exchange addresses. And yeah, there's no, that's one thing that will have to be done. Someone has to set up a mailing system that for a mailing list that, so we can communicate with each other. So we need some people that are willing to help with the groundwork and help distribute and share the information about this. So thanks a lot for all your attention and uh, I hope we provided a good, um, some interesting questions or answers.